Okay, so we're in Bhakti Shastri, Unit 2, studying the Bhagavad Gita, and this is Lesson 2, the Yoga Ladder. In the last class, we looked at the different yoga systems, so today we're going to see the connection between these systems and how these different yoga systems form a, a yoga, what is called the Yoga Ladder. So from the third chapter, we see how karma kanda becomes karma yoga. Would someone read, please? Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I? Please. By performance of yoga, once eating must become sanctified, and by eating sanctified foodstuffs, one's very existence becomes purified. By the purification of existence, finer tissues in the memory become sanctified and when memory is sanctified one can think of the path of liberation 3.11 per quote all right so Prabhupada is describing here how in the beginning we're performing yagya somebody's doing a yagya and it may be that they're performing the yagya with some material motive some material desires in mind but because in the course of the yagya uh, the foodstuffs are offered, and then the same, we, then we take the, the remnants of the yagya, the foodstuffs which are offered, and we become purified. And with the purification of the memory, purification of our mind, then it's easier for us to think of Krishna or the path of liberation. So we need to purify our, our mind and senses. And we can do it. Sometimes begin with karma kanda and it will lead us to karma yoga, hopefully. Of course, some people are very attached. They just want only the material results. Okay, so then from karma kanda, then it becomes uh, not niskam karma yoga, but, uh, but uh, sukama karma yoga. Karma yoga with material desires, attached. We don't sacrifice much of the fruit. Okay. From the purport, text number 11 in the third chapter. Remember the third chapter, the section, I think 10 to 16 is describing how karma kanda comes to karma yoga. Lord Vishnu is worshipped in all yagnas as the chief beneficiary. So you can see in the sacrifice, performing a Agnihotri sacrifice, and Lord Vishnu is appearing. Actually, when you do the Agnihotri sacrifice, the fire, that fire represents Lord Vishnu. And we offer the food grains, we offer the ghee into the fire. So it's non different from offering to Lord Vishnu. So the purpose of the sacrifice is meant to be for the pleasure of Lord Vishnu. It's meant to be for his enjoyment. So this is, you could say, karma yoga. Although the purpose, the people performing it may have material desires, if they're actually performing the yagya properly, they have to remember Lord Vishnu, and he is worshipped by the yagya. It's for his pleasure, his enjoyment. Verse number 15. Tasmat sarvagatam brahma nityam yagne pratishtitam. All pervading transcendence is eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. All pervading transcendence is referring to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna. So they are eternally situated in acts of sacrifice. The acts of sacrifice may be a fire yagya, it may be Harinam Sankirtan. There are different ways of performing sacrifice. That was described in chapter 4 of the Bhagavad Gita. 
you can read different ways of sacrificing things for the pleasure of the Lord. Sacrifice one's hearing, sacrifice one's knowledge, uh, sacrifice in family life by controlling the senses, sacrifice by taking shelter of a spiritual master and hearing from him, rendering service to the spiritual teacher. It's a sacrifice. So these are all mentioned in the fourth chapter. And these sacrifices are actually representations of the Supreme Lord. All right, so we're going to have some exercise for you here today. Yagna Prabhu, are you there? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so we need to make some groups. How many devotees do we have this morning? Eighteen. Okay, we want to have eighteen. We can have six groups of three. Three people in each group. Six groups, right? So, we'll make six groups and there will be different questions for, uh, we'll have three questions. So, group one and two will take number one, group three and four will take question two, and group five and six will take question three. Right? So, here's the question. Question number Refer, first of all, refer, respond with reference to Bhagavad Gita, third chapter, text 10 to 16. For, for, for group 1 and 2, your question is, you meet a gentleman at a home program who criticizes ISKCON for neglecting to worship the demigods. How are you going to respond? And we want you to respond in relation to what's said in Bhagavad Gita, 3.10 to 16. All right? Clear? Group 1 and 2? And then group 3 and 4. A talkback TV program has a section on environmental issues. The interviewer has invited you on the show to discuss a spiritual solution to the environmental challenges, the Vedic percep percep perspective. The Vedic perspective, right? And you have to use again the same section of Bhagavad Gita, dealing with environmental issues, and the solution, a spiritual solution to our challenges on the environment. Is it clear? The Vedic perspective. And finally, group five and six. In our modern technological society, it is believed that by intelligence and use of natural resources, man can produce all his necessities. The notion that there are demigods who supply heat, light, rain, etc., and who should therefore be supplicated, is considered a primitive absurdity. So, group five and six, you have to deal with this. You get these kind of materialistic modern people, they say that Technology is solving all the problems of the world, right? Believe by intelligence and use of natural resources, man can produce all his necessities. In other words, they're saying, you don't need demigods. They say the notion that there are demigods who supply these things, that's just absurdity. It's not true. It's not it's not the truth, it's just nonsense, it's just made up, it doesn't make any sense, there's no logic. We never saw these people, we've never seen these demigods, you never see them. How do you know they're there? 
Understand the question? Group five and six? All right. So did you put everybody in a group? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. All right. Krishna. Krishna. Our question is this. Uh, you meet a gentleman at home at a home program who criticizes his corn for neglecting to worship demigods. Right. Can just go through the uh, translations of three point one from three point ten. In the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of men and demigods, along with sacrifices for Vishnu, and blessed them by saying, "Be thou happy by this yagna, because its performance will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation." So, uh, in this, in this uh, verse, is there anything mention of demigods, worship of demigods, like that? No, but I think the purpose might have, uh, will uh, have the... When we do some yatna. Um... Uh, it is mentioned like, Vedaya Sacharvam, Atame Vedaya. So, primarily it mentioned like, Lord Vishnu is the uh, chief beneficiary. We can, I think we are from this purpose, it is mentioned about, particularly about Lord Vishnu. He is the core beneficiary. Yes, Prabhupada. 15.15 yeah. right so yeah. that he, he uh, understanding uh, understanding the lord is the essence of uh, uh, understanding the vedas is actually understanding the lord like that and then eleven is talks about the demigods the demigods being pleased by sacrifices will also please you and thus by cooperation between men and demigods prosperity will reign for all Okay. The demigods are empowered administrator of material affairs. The supply of air, light, water and all other benedictions for maintaining the body and soul of every living entity is entrust It is given like some Kirtan Yagya is done for all and it is, we can say like if somebody comes and demor uh, demoralize us for why we are not worshipping Danigo. So we can say as from the Bhagavad Gita taken by Lord Krishna himself, uh, it is given like uh, some Kirtan Yagya is the topmost of Kali uh, followed by all. And it is a easy, there is no point of falling down uh, while doing some Kirtan. But in worship of demigods, we need to follow many rules and regulations. Yes, so it is also given that, uh, <coughs> uh, I guess, in th text number 14, um, in the purport, I think it's. Um, Kaupad says the Supreme Lord is known as the Yagya Purusha, the personal beneficiary of all sacrifices, and he describes how different demigods are like, uh, you know, um, serving him and different like, limbs of the body serve, serve the whole. So, we can say if you're actually worshipping the Supreme Lord himself, then we don't have to serve the different parts, right? So, yes, it, it is like watering the roots. Mm -hmm. Like what? 
time we enjoy the whatever given to us by nature without offering them to them is not then it's like a thief consider this greed right yes one should perform his prescribed duties. Can we say that? Mm. And then text 15 is speaking about regular but questions. Yeah, that's what it is. We also have to, we also have to perform yagyas, I suppose. Yes. We should mention, maybe, we should mention it also. Prabhu, can you be the speaker today? I have a sore throat. I cannot actually. Uh, <coughs> Is the to screen the speaker? No problem. Just can be mentioned. But the best uh, yagya is Sankirtana yagya. Yes, uh, we can see in text 15 as well, uh, regulated activities are prescribed in the Vedas and the Vedas are directly manifested from the Supreme Supreme Godhead. Consequently, the all-pervading transcendence is eternally situated in it. spiritual life is causing in the material the spiritual life is the, the pollution removal the environmental cleaning starts with the spiritual uh, cleaning of the consciousness I, th I think maybe we can ask Maharaj because we are a little confused Maharaj is okay with us right now what's the problem what's the confusion Hare Krishna Maharaj Hare Krishna yes we are we read the translation and we are reading the purports but we are not finding much connection between environment and this world this much well we have to understand it for ourselves how the environment is very much under the control of the demigods like there's a demigod in charge of air there's a demigod in charge of uh, nature like the trees you need, you need rain to have forests, you need rain in order to have agriculture, to produce food for the people. That rain comes by the demigods. So many factors are there. It's all under the control of the demigods. And we have to understand how much the materialists are damaging the environment how they're trying to control everything by their science and you know doing things like genetically modified crops how they're ruining everything and how they've ruined so many things with their uh, fertilizers and uh, uh, insecticides and these different things simply created so many problems in the environment motor cars also didn't really help the world and created a lot of problems, a lot of, a lot of pollution, a lot of dangers. They're all environmental issues. And so you, you make a list of the environmental issues, the problems which you see in the world and you can understand how much the demigods actually are being neglected. We're not we're not appreciating that these fa these different facts are all under the control of the demigods, Lord Krishna's arrangement. 
come 33 crore demigods, right? They're all in charge of every different aspect of this material world. And fishing also, they go into the sea and they take so many fish out of the sea. It also creates a lot of problems. We're putting all of our sewage into the sea, our waste. It's all passed off into the sea. We've, we've ruined the world. We haven't helped the world. We've done a lot of harm to the world. And now we're reaping the results with things like COVID. It's the results of all of our sinful activities. So, we're saying, give some attention to the devas. The demigods, you, you want to get cures? The demigods can give probably the best cure. Ashwini Kumars are there, they're physicians. So the demigods do have a lot of uh, influence in controlling nature. And we can see examples in Krishna Leela. How when Lord Krishna was present on the planet, there was no scarcity. Everything was in abundance. It's very important for us to please, please the demigods. All right, those are some thoughts. Thank you, Maharaj. Yagna. Yagna Prabhu. Yagna Prabhu. Without which no one can live. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, our our life depends on these uh, supply from uh, lords. Okay. Lastly, right. lastly, even our manufacturing enterprise, we require so many raw material like uh, metal, sulfur, uh, and so many essential. All these are supplied by the agent of lord with the purpose that we should make proper use of them, uh, keeping us distinct. And lastly, the point mentioned by you in text number 14, you can... Uh, okay. okay. Uh, let me find text 14. Who is okay with that? Anna, Anna, did you get anything in text number 15 and 16? I'm just reading. We'll okay. let you know. Just okay. I'm also reading now 15 and 16. Uh, Mithagopi Mataji, you can define these points which we told you. Okay, right. So, Prabhuji, uh, would you just tell me what did you uh, get it from? I got it from text number 12 only.
Maraj, you are muted. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Prabhu Yagna, can you hear me? Yes. So the internet is very slow. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. Oh. Okay, I had a difficulty to get into room five. I couldn't open it. Now I'm in. I want to hear what they're saying. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you hear me? Yes, Maharaj, I can hear you. Are you, yes, ha, are you, have you had a discussion about this? Uh, yes, Maharaj, we had discussion and we have uh, come to certain points from the references which we have given from 3.10 mm -hmm. and further. So uh, we have listed down certain points that uh, how these natural resources which we are getting, the raw material which we are getting is uh, actually not produced by us. Definitely we can use these raw materials to produce certain other things, but the raw material in itself we cannot produce, like the soil we cannot produce, the heat, light, air, water, all these things we cannot produce. That is owned and controlled by Lord only, and Lord is providing us all these things. And uh, the Supreme Lord has appointed demigods as his officers who are helping us to provide these things, like if we do yagna sacrifices. Okay, uh, okay, this is very good. You Now, when you make the presentation, you can present to the class. That's very Thank nice. You, Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Yagna? Yagna Prabhu? Yagna? Yes, yes, Maharaj. We can close the rooms now. All right. I think everyone's back. Can we have a spokesman from group number one? Yes, yes, ma'am. To present how they respond to this. You meet a gentleman at a home program who criticizes ISKCON for neglecting to worship the demigods. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tanvat Pranam. I will be representing group number one, um, Maharaj. So uh, the points we have to actually um, um, tell the particular gentleman uh, is actually demigods are empowered administrators of material affairs. And uh, uh, Lord Vishnu is the chief beneficiary of all the yagnas. Um, so uh, the ultimate satisfaction is for the yagnapati who is actually uh, the Bhoktaram Yagna Tapasam of, uh, and he is the chief uh, beneficiary of all the Yagnas. And also, uh, 
basically the yagnas is actually to purify our senses and lead us on the path of liberation and thus make us uh, more krishna conscious and it makes us um, godly in all respects and also the uh, in in the purport of 3.10 it is very clearly mentioned that uh, in the age of kali the sankirtan yagna is recommended by the vedic scriptures itself and uh, and chaitanya mahaprabhu has actually given uh, this sankirtan yagna uh, for us to be followed and uh, sankirtan yagna and krishna consciousness go very well together so uh, it is easy for us to actually directly satisfy uh, lord vishnu who is actually the chief beneficiary by following krishna consciousness and doing sankirtan yagna and also uh, demigods are not qualified to give anything beyond the material benefit so they may not be able to lead us to the path of liberation so uh, uh, which actually lord krishna will be able to take us beyond this material world and also there are uh, uh, the demigods are mentioned to be as 33 crores of them who are innumerable assistants in different parts of the body of the supreme personality of god so each of them have a portfolio and an administration to take care and they are responsible only for that part like how um, prabhupad often mentions giving examples like uh, when we are feeding the stomach all the other parts of the body gets energized and we don't feed the separate parts of the body separately like hands legs like that so similarly when we are uh, when we are uh, offering sacrifices to lord vishnu uh, by means of sankirtan yagna especially mentioned in kali yuga uh, we will be able to satisfy all the demigods who are actually devotees of the lord so um, these are the points we have mm -hmm. uh, to actually contract uh, the question uh, posed by the gentleman maraj so i would question that you said you know demigods are not going to provide liberation for us but they do we do they do provide a lot for us and so aren't, aren't we neglecting them but all these benefits are very temporary whatever they are providing and uh, we are looking at uh, at uh, an eternal uh, uh, place in the lord service um, well not everybody's on that platform you know the gentleman at the home program he's not thinking about liberation you know he's simply concerned with the the life in this world and he wants to see that he can provide nicely for his family and he wants to they should have a good environment and to bring the children up and you know and the demigods they have a big say in these things i uh, yes maharaj but uh, here again this point of by performance of yagna uh, conditioned souls gradually become krishna consciousness and become godly in all respects and also since lord krishna is the supreme personality of godhead he can satisfy us in all ways he can actually give us all the material benefits which the demigods can can give us so uh, uh, so that point uh, we may have to uh, explain to the person that uh, uh, like how a prime minister uh, is having control over the whole of the government and uh, uh, he can actually uh, sanction us anything uh, similarly uh, Uh, lord krishna is actually um, will be able to give us all material benefits if we are directly able to uh, um, worship the supreme personality of god oh, okay thank you hari krishna maharaj all right let's hear at uh, group number 2 do you have anything to add to what group number 1 said hari krishna maharaj ji tell me pranam as mata ji has covered all the points so like still i want to add few examples of it like uh, uh, lord in in Uh, Vindavan, uh, Vindavan was used to worship Lord Indu for the rainfall. They depend on demigods. I couldn't. I'm, I'm, it's not clear what happened. Vindavan, what? Vijvasi, uh, Vijvasi used to worship Lord Indu, or because they depend on the rainfall for the green tree and the production. Uh, so, like they used to worship over the food and every year get the Lord demigod, uh, Lord Indra. But uh, Lord Krishna himself asked Vijvasi to worship. 
Govardhan because Govardhan provides the trees, cows, the food, all the stuff required for the existence. So he asked there is no need to worship Lord Indra. So he decided that take all the material stuff and worship Lord Guru Govardhan. He will he provides you everything. So like they they worship and then Lord Indra get uh, uh, angry on the Vidvasi. Then he made a huge rainfall. Uh, then Lord lifted up the Govardhan. He proved that he is the only one who oh, okay, care of everyone. You, because Lord Indra was not able to do anything in of Lord Krishna. So at the last also he uh, Lord Indra asked uh, for benediction from Lord Krishna himself and offered the Surbi cow to him. The milk of Surbi cow. Why should it be the cow of milk of Surbi cow? Another example like of Pandavas Meera when they were in forest so uh, Duryodhan sent Durvasa Muni to curse the Pandavas and so Durvasa Muni came with all a number of Munis for the food uh, at the home of Yudhishthi so but the uh, food of the Draupadi was almost finished and then she remembered Lord Krishna then Lord Krishna came and ate the last grain of rice then all the Munis got satisfied here it is indicating like if Lord is satisfied, uh, everyone is satisfied. We need, need not to satisfy everyone in this world because it is not possible for us to satisfy everyone. And also there is one more example in Bhagavatam like uh, uh, by sticking to the tail of dogs, we cannot cross this material ocean. Like then goats are considered compared to the dog like uh, by sticking to the tail of the dog, we can't cross this material world. We need to worship Lord Krishna. And also the analogy of stomach, like we need to satisfy stomach. If stomach is satisfied, all the body part gets satisfied. We have no need to feed uh, hands separately, legs separately. Only from the stomach, all nutrients go, go distributed in the body. And if you worship the, one more analogy, worship the roots of the tree, then all the twigs, uh, roots uh, get uh, nourished. There's no need to worship the leaves separately. The roots should be worshipped. And Lord Vishnu is being defined as supreme beneficiary. Yagya Purush. He is the Yagya Purush. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we say we pour the water on the root. We don't pour the water on the leaves and branches. Right? We, we pour the water on the root. So Lord Krishna is the root. He's the Mula Prakriti, the root of the material existence. So by satisfying Lord Krishna, then all the demigods are also satisfied. So, very nice examples from the scriptures. Thank you for that, Prabhu. Okay, so we'll go ahead to the next question, which is groups number three, first of all, and four. First group number three, dealing with the environmental issue, television interviewer. We want a spiritual solution to our environmental challenges. So, uh, first of all, uh, we will go to what, why are we having all these problems? So, the environmental challenges that we are, that have our society is facing, uh, mainly is because uh, the people nowadays, they are just enjoying the fruits of nature and not, uh, not uh, having gratitude uh, towards who is uh, giving us all this? Meaning that the yajna is performed uh, those days to satisfy Lord Vishnu and also the demigods. So by this, when they are satisfied, a uh, sufficient amount of uh, necess necessities are provided to the uh, mankind or humans. So, but uh, nowadays, as we can see, uh, people are not doing that. They are not uh, doing any kind of yajnas to please the Supreme Lord or the demigods. So that is why we are facing all uh, this kind of uh, environmental challenges. So to overcome this, uh, spiritually what we have to do is that we have to go back to performing the yajyas. Uh, so the main, uh, the main yajya for this age, because uh, we can't perform the yajyas which was done previously in previous yugas because we don't have so much of qualified brahmanas or sages in this age. 
So the highly recommended yajna for this age would be the Sankirtana yajna, which will definitely please not only the Supreme Lord but also the demigods. Then we can overcome this uh, environmental uh, scarcity, which is happening in our society. So uh, Escon is providing this very well. So uh, anyone who comes uh, here, our main goal will be to perform the Sankirtana yajna. So, why are we facing so many challenges then with our environment? You know, your ISKCON is here and you're chanting Hare Krishna. Why do we have so many challenges in our environment? Uh, because, Maharaj, not everyone is performing the Yajna. Uh, only a certain uh, community now is performing this uh, Sankirtana Yajna. So, it is not, still not enough. Have you got any examples where chanting Hare Krishna helped to save the environment? Can for you example, you got any proof? Say, like, uh, for example, I would say like uh, the places like in the Holy Dam. So uh, because his uh, Sankirtana Yajna is very uh, done in mass scale, so uh, in those places uh, the material, uh, the environmental problems are lesser compared to other countries such as the African, African countries which is uh, la giving less importance to this, they are facing uh, more kind of uh, environmental problems. I don't know about that. I, when I go to the Holy Dam, I'm, sometimes I'm disgusted to see the environment. There's so much garbage everywhere and pollution and the, you know, the muddy, the, the drains are all open and there's so many mosquitoes. I mean, I don't see that the environment there is so much better. You know, you're on a TV program, you have to expect this kind of thing. The interviewer is going to challenge you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Maharaj. I'm thinking of uh, how to answer that question. Okay, we'll go ahead to the next group. Let's hear group number four. So, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, I will try to uh, present the group four. Uh, so, the question here is that how is gone? Is, uh, uh, the, is there a spiritual solution to the environmental challenges? So, to, to understand that, first of all, we have to know what are the impacts that that we are having in terms of environment and uh, why we are having them. So we are having this problem of uh, global warming, floods, droughts, and uh, you know, like uh, basically water issues and also heat. So uh, all these issues are happening you know, primarily because of the misuse of the resources or trying to control the resources or you know like say for, for example they are they are eating so much of uh, non-vegetarian food and non-vegetarian food is causing so much of global warming uh, because they uh, they have to raise the cattle and then they have to have the grasslands and that creates uh, so much global warming then there is so much deforestation going on and that is also causing the you know the air to be impure as well as uh, lack of rains and everything so all these things are happening because uh, humans are trying to control the environment and the, the resources that we are getting are being misused so i would say that from based on the scriptural point of view what we should be doing is that we should be uh, first of all do not misuse the the environmental resources that we have and also we should uh, perhaps uh, eat with understanding and we should we should follow the scriptures like in this it says that yagna sastra sinasanto or all these verses say that we should be grateful to the demigods and on and, and when we are grateful like by performing yagyas or you know like i mean at least not misusing the resources then probably we can, uh, you know, like solve these environmental problems rather than uh, 
just continue to misuse these resources. I'm, 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 I didn't quite see the connection between uh, global warming and killing the animals. You know, I mean, I, I'm certainly I can understand killing animals is not very nice, but I, I have difficulty to see how this relates to global warming. Usually I think the yes. global warming being caused more by things like motor cars, burning petrol, and then air conditioners, running air conditioners all over the world. People are very fond of running air conditioning. And, some, and this, these kind of things create a lot of global warming. That's definitely, Marat. That, that, is, that is definitely one of the main reasons. But non eating non-vegetarian food, what happens is that like they have a industry which is, uh, which is you know, they are raising this cattle. And to raise the cattle, they need a lots of fields which are having grass. And, this, uh, and because of that, they have to do the deforestation and, and just grow the, 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 the grass. And that creates a problem in having, an, you know, like, I mean, having, uh, you know, like less clean air, basically, and global warming. Oh, this, this is news to me. Usually, I, you know, the, 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 the cattle, they, they don't even get much grass. They're kept in the, sh in the barn, they're kept in confinement. They're not given much uh, facility to go out in the fields and graze which is actually what they want. They like to be out there in the fields and graze and eat the grass, but they're not given that ch chance so much. So, I, I think maybe they are just cutting the grass and giving it to them, so basically. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyway, certainly. Uh, Maharaj, yes? Uh, can I add something more to the group? I'm a part of the same group. Yeah, please With add. animal agriculture, especially with the beef industry, uh, because they're disposing, the, you know, the remaining of the carcass, which is producing so much of, of toxin that is destroying the environment also, is destroying the ozone. This is an additional point to what Kasiba Muni is saying here. So when they dispose of the... Uh, the, the last thing I read is that 27%, it was 14, but I understand now it is 27% of the cause of global warming is because of agric um, animal agriculture. Animal agriculture, seven percent. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, it's a significant amount. Yeah. Okay, so certainly environmental issues, the meat industry is affecting the environment. Certainly, deforestation is also a challenge to the environment. In so many ways, we're polluting the environment. We've, we've damaged the environment. As you say, global warming and air pollution and sound pollution. So many, everything practically. We've ruined the seas. And there's, nothing, there's nothing safe from man. Man comes and just completely plunders and destroys the environment. And we, we see so many issues there in the environment, species uh, being extinguished, and, you, you know, the, the last surviving, just a few whales are left. There's only a few of the, the different species because men have come along and killed them and hunted them, and they're all gone. And so the environment faces a lot of challenges. And as you say, we have to respect the environment, that it's not ours. We came with nothing, but it was given to us and we were meant to use it, but we abused it. So people have to learn how to make proper use of the environment. And so a spiritual solution to the environment challenges is res respecting that there are personalities behind the environment. There are, there is a hierarchy behind nature. We speak of nature. Nature does not act on its own independently. We say nature, whose nature? Nature means a person, just like I have my nature, you have your nature. So the environment, when we speak of nature in the world, it implies also personality. There's pers and everything is personal. 
And there's personalities behind the environment and we have to learn to respect them and how to live in a manner which cooperates with their desires, preserving and protecting the environment. Okay, let's go ahead. The, the, the next question, group number five. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Pinpat Pranam. Uh, Maharaj, I will try to present. Uh, yes, please. In regard with the group number five. So, uh, what we came to the conclusion was that uh, the question is that uh, in our modern technology, uh, technological society, it is believed that by intelligence and use of natural resources, man can produce all the necessity things which are required. So, uh, no doubt we can produce, we produce things uh, using the resources which we have, but we cannot produce the raw material actually. Whatever we are producing is with the help of raw material which we have got as a gift from the Lord. For example, uh, we can say in uh, 3.10 also it is mentioned that God is the creator and the supplier of everything. In Ishopanishad also we learned that uh, Krishna is the owner and uh, uh, maintainer of uh, everything. Everything is owned and maintained by Lord only. So the heat, light, water, air, whatever we are getting. Uh, for example, the sand, uh, the soil which we use for cultivation of crops, that soil we are not producing. The metals which we use for different uh, things, those metals we are getting as a raw material from Mother Nature, that we are not producing on our own. So that's why we need to understand this thing, that all these things and facilities have been provided by the Lord to us. In 3.12 also, it is mentioned that uh, God has given the authority to demigods to supply uh, uh, as to work as a supplying agent of all the things which are required for the sustenance of the human beings and other creatures on the earth so uh, if we don't if we are performing yagna and uh, uh, demigods are pleased with us and when they are pleased with us they supply us with our necessities as it is mentioned in 3.14 so when we are getting what is needed by us, what is our requirement, so it becomes our duty that we should offer something in return to them. Because if we are not doing so, then we are considered as thief. Because whatever is there in the creation is owned by the God only. We are not the owner of anything over here. Everything is controlled and owned by Lord. So if we are getting something from them, we should return, we should offer something to them because, uh, for example, like in Krishna consciousness, uh, we being devotees, we don't eat food, we take prasadam. We first offer it to Lord and then we have it as a prasadam. Because if we eat it like that only without offering, then what happens that we get the sinful reactions. Even though if we are eating or even though if we are drinking, when we are inhaling air, there are molecules around us, so we are killing them. So in different ways, we are uh, getting into the trap of the sinful reactions. And that's why the yagnas are uh, uh, recommended, because by uh, doing sacrifices, the ultimate beneficiary, as you Maharaj said, is Vishnu only. So when we uh, offer something to demigods also in the yagna, so it is ultimately going to Lord Vishnu only and because we are offering something to Lord Vishnu, so our path for liberation gradually opens up. So um, this was uh, what we understood, Maharaj, from uh, these references. Yes, very nice. Thank you Thank so you. much, Maharaj. Very nice, with nice references also. Very good. Thank you, Maharaj. Would the group number six be able to add anything which she did not cover? Thank you, Samaras. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Group Six. Uh -huh. um, Maras, I have actually the all the points are pretty much covered by other groups. I have the kind of the same points. Uh, let me read what I what, we, what our group is, uh, decided to gather. 
Um, our, so uh, Vishnu is the uh, Supreme Godhead, he is the ultimate beneficiary. And um, all other demigods are like, uh, um, I mean, Vishnu is like a, see a, a, a director for the company and all other demigods are like a, a department head, like Indra for the rain department and who gives the rain. And um, so all our necessities of life uh, are supplied by the agents of Lord. Um, uh, no one can manufacture anything without the help from um, help from them, like fruits and vegetables, uh, you know, water, aid, any any food stuffs, um, any food stuffs are you know not possible to grow without their help. Um, when we perform again, they become pleased. Okay. And um, so even for the, not only the food stuff, even for the, um, any raw material for the, you know, for any manufacturer company, also are also provided by them. And like steel, metal, and any, any raw materials. Okay, thank you and, very um, much. Okay, thank you. Therefore, yeah. yes. Therefore, ultimately, we should depend on production of the field, uh, in a, uh, not on the production of the factories. Production of field uh, depends on all rains and light moon that are all controlled by them. Yeah. And who are the demigod, who are the servants of Supreme Lord? Uh, uh, and the Lord is the ultimate beneficiary and personality, main personality behind everything mm -hmm. that helps to exist. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a reference, actually, I'd give. It's in, it's in Science of Self-Realization. We have an example. Uh, there was a, a drought in Andhra Pradesh, and there was a lot of cattle dying, and it was a very serious situation. And the head of the drug committee, he wrote to Srila Prabhupada, and he asked Srila Prabhupada to contribute some financial support to their campaign to help fight against the drought. And Prabhupada wrote back to him and said that uh, the solution to this is that you have to do yagya. He said you have to, the, the proper yagya is the chanting of the holy name. And he said when you properly satisfy the demigods then we won't have these problems. And it happened that a short while later, Srila Prabhupada went to Hyderabad with the devotees and they had a big program and they had a big kirtan and that first night there was a heavy rain. So Prabhupada said, you see, because we did kirtan, so we brought the rain. And so, and he said, now the, the drug problem is over by sang kirtan. So it was a nice example how Prabhupada personally demonstrated, the devotees demonstrated by Sankirtan, they could get rain and they could solve the, the drought. Okay, we're going to go ahead. Oh, someone please read. Yes, please. Evam para evam pravar vidam chakram. This is a cycle. This is a cycle. We are living on food grains, grains, vegetables. They are actually our food. Now I am living and getting energy by eating grains and vegetables. And how my energy should be utilized? It should be utilized for the purpose from where I am getting energy. I am getting energy from the Supreme Lord by supply of this food stuff. Therefore, my energy should be utilized for the service of the Supreme Lord. Bhagavad Gita 3.11-19, Los Angeles, December 27, 1968. Yes. So Prabhupada's point, very nice. We're getting energy from the Lord. He gives us food. From the food we get our energy. So our energy is meant for service to Krishna. So this is the cycle eating grains and vegetables, the energy is provided by Krishna, use our energy. All right, go ahead, someone read please. Hare Krishna Maharaj Ji, 
Krishna? Yes, go ahead, Prabhu. A yogi is greater than the ascetic, greater than the empiricist, and greater than the fruitive worker. Therefore, O Arjun, in all circumstances, be a yogi. Bhagavad Gita 6.46. Okay. An ascetic, somebody doing tapasya, an empiricist, the speculator, and then the fruit of worker, the karmi. So in all circumstances, be a yogi. The yogi is greater than all these people. It's the yoga ladder. Yes? Someone read? Hare Krishna. Yes, Mataji, go ahead. It may be yoga ladder. It may be compared to a ladder for attaining the topmost spiritual realization. This ladder begins from the lowest material condition of the living entity and rises up to perfect self-realization in pure spiritual life. According to various elevations, different parts of the ladder are known by different names. But all in all, the complete ladder is called yoga. 6.3 Purpat. Mm. All right. So it's a ladder for attaining spiritual realization. From the, the ladder begins from the lowest material condition of the living entity. Lowest material condition, we may say animal life. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, animal life, that's it, maybe the, the bottom, you know. Animals, they're just concerned with eating, sleeping, mating and defending. Of course, they're not, re they're not on the yoga ladder. But that's at the bottom of the yoga ladder. And then a little better than animal life is karma kandis, who want to enjoy the material world. And they try to do it according to the Vedas, doing rituals and so on, satisfy demigods. So they're still not on the yoga ladder, but they're at the bottom of the yoga ladder. Okay, but it does, the ladder does go on and it goes all the way up to pure spiritual life and perfect self-realization. We will see how. So, Prabhupada said, gradual process. Someone read? Yes? Yes, the gradual process, progress of the of yoga system. Karma yoga to jnana yoga. Karma yoga means fruit of activities, pious activities, or prescribed activities. Then, by performing karma yoga, one comes to the platform of jnana yoga, knowledge. And from knowledge to this ashtanga yoga, dhyana yoga. Then, from ashtanga yoga, concentrating the mind on Vishnu, come to the point of bhakti yoga. Bhagavad Gita 6.46-47 Okay, so the gradual process, progress, the gradual. Hopefully, the karma kandi will come to karma yoga, right? How will the karma kandi come to karma yoga? Well, he may hear. Yeah, if he's doing karma kandi activities, he may be going to the temple and he may be using the brahmanas to perform the rituals. And so, he will understand that the benefits which he's getting from his karma kandi activities is material and temporary. And he will begin to see the problems in the results of his work. He will see, for example, family quarreling and people dying in the family, people leaving the body. He will see different problems coming and he will understand that the karma kandi solution is not eternal. It's not going to give any eternal lasting solution to the problems. So he may inquire from the brahmanas there and he may learn about karma yoga, that he can get better benefit rather than just thinking of going to heaven and trying to enjoy a temporary life in the heavenly planets he can learn that he could get liberation. And the beginning of the liberated path is doing karma yoga. 
sacrificing the fruit of his work for the pleasure of the Supreme. So Karma Yogi, he sacrifices the work, but he doesn't know really anything. He hasn't got much knowledge. He may not know even who he is or may not have a lot of idea about who the, he won't know about who the Supreme is. So then he gets some knowledge. He learns about the material nature, the nature of the creation and dis destruction, how everything in this world is temporary and he will get a good understanding of the knowledge from the scriptures and he will learn about the Lord in the heart as the super soul. And when he hears about the Lord in the heart, then from Jnana Yoga he may come to Astanga Yoga where he meditates on the Lord in the heart. And the result of meditation on, us, on the Lord in the heart, we hope, is that from Astanga Yoga, he can come to Bhakti Yoga. He can come to the highest point of the Yoga Ladder. Right? So here's the Yoga Ladder. Right? We have Bhakti Yoga and there's different realizations. Somebody's going to realize the Brahman and somebody else, like the yogis, they're more interested in the Paramatma. Okay, and at the bottom we have the Karmakandi, Karmakanda path, right? Karmakanda path, we said that's material, it's not spiritual. In, in the second chapter Krishna told Arjuna uh, that by fighting you will open the doors to liberation. So that's Karmakanda. Liberation, if you die in the battle, opens the doors to liberation. I mean, you go to the heavenly planets like that, you will enjoy there. So Karmakanda, sometimes they want enjoyment in this life, sometimes they're thinking about the next life, going to higher planets. I want a child, I want a son. I want a long life, I want to cure my disease. This is all karmakanda. And the higher karmakandis, I want to go to heaven in the next life. I want to enjoy the heavenly planets. It's karmakanda. But karmakanda. I have a question on karmakanda. Yes. Before. Okay. <clears throat> Maharaj, you mentioned like um, curing from diseases and having the children and. How is that related to Bhakti Yoga, Maharaj? Because uh, when, we, when we individually become sick, we obviously want it to be cured. And therefore that will uh, kind of a karmakanda. And then obviously if someone, some devotees are, uh, they don't have a children and they obviously want to have a children. Of course, Krishna conscious children. And then how this karmakanda related to that, in that situation also? Well, the Karmakanda process is by worshipping demigods and doing ritualistic activities. And bhakti yoga is by hearing and chanting, worshipping Vishnu, worshipping Krishna. So it's, it's a question of how you're going to... The, the desires may be there. So if somebody's a devotee and they have sickness or they want a child or something like that, so they can continue to do bhakti yoga but they're performing the bhakti yoga with some material consciousness. So it's not pure devotion, it's called karma mishra bhakti. And it's much better to do karma mishra bhakti than to do karma kanda activities. Can you understand Prabhu? Uh, yes Maharaj. Karma mishra, but, karma mishra bhakti. Mara, that does mean when we when we become sick, that doesn't mean like we should not worship, like we should not pray that oh I want to become cured and then so that I can do better devotion service. Is that comes under karma kanda or? Uh... That's well, if you pray to Krishna or Vishnu, it's bhakti yoga. It's not karma kanda. It's bhakti yoga.
if you're praying to Krishna, but we're praying with some material desire. So it's not pure devotion. It's devotion mixed with some desire. So it's called karma mishra bhakti. It's devotion mixed with the material desire. So Maharaj, does that mean uh, material desires means as long as we pray for sense gratification? Yes. Well, okay. you, we all need some sense gratification. Certainly, you have a disease, and you pray to Krishna, you know, you could say that sense, for sense gratification, I want to be healthy. Some other person, they may just accept, well, I have a disease, it's Krishna's mercy. A devotee may think, you know, the, the, the devotee may think, I have a disease, I'm suffering, it's the result of my past activities, I accept it, and I go on with my devotion. I continue my devotion. Our devotee is a ma married person, and his, he and his wife, they want to have a child. So, they perform the, the Garbhadana Samskar, and they try to get a child. If they don't get a child, they accept it. It's the arrangement of Krishna. That they did everything the right way, but Krishna didn't give them a child. And so they accept it. That's Bhakti Yoga. They would like to have a child, so they, they try again. And they, if Krishna wants, Krishna will give them. But the Karmakandi person, they're going to the demigods and they're petitioning the devas, we want this, you have to give us this, and they're making, uh, they're spending a lot of money and giving a lot of uh, charity and so on to karmis and to, to these Karmakandi pandits and performing the rituals and they're petitioning, give me, give me, we want, we want. I want to get cured of my health. Why? So I can do more sense gratification. So I can, you know, do, go back to the material world and enjoy. The Karmakandi is not thinking that I want to serve Krishna, but the devotee, he's thinking I want to get healthy so I can serve Krishna better. Yes. One devotee, he's thinking I want to get healthy so I can serve Krishna better. And another devotee, he simply accepts it. Well, I've got this disease, it must be due to my karma, my past reactions, I'm suffering, but I'm going to go on with my devotional service. So we see examples like there was the one in Chaitanya Charitamrita, there's a nice example. The leper, Vasudev. The leper Vasudev. Uh, Lord Chaitanya had been at Kurmakshetra and he was coming out of Kurmakshetra. Was it Kurmakshetra? Anyway, he met this uh, Brahmana, the leper Vasudev. His body was filled with leprosy and the worms were eating his flesh. So sometimes a worm would fall out of his body and he would pick it up and put it back in because he thought, he's living in my body, I should let him stay there. So Lord Chaitanya came there and Lord Chaitanya embraced the leper Vasudev and immediately the, the leper Vasudev's body became transformed and rejuvenated and cured of leprosy. So the leper Vasudev then said to Lord Chaitanya that, oh, now it may be difficult for me that you've made my body healthy, you've rejuvenated me, I may want sense gratification now. I may be inclined to material life. So Lord Chaitanya instructed him, so now you have to constantly chant Maha Mantra and preach Krishna consciousness. And that way you will protect yourself from material life. So that's an extreme example of how the slapper Vasudev tolerated his disease. Yes, disease is a big disturbance to our devotional service. But, you know, we're not God, we're not the supreme controller. And we go to doctors and we take different medicines and so on, but they're also not God, they're also not supreme. 
ultimately it's all in the hands of Lord Krishna, the Supreme Lord. He's the Supreme Controller. So there are different solutions. You could try the Karma Kandi approach and go to the demigods. You have faith in the demigods, you have faith in these Karma Kandi uh, priests, the brahmanas who do the Karma Kandi rituals. You go to them. You may be successful, you may not. But a devotee, he will continue with his bhakti yoga. He will continue to do his chanting and he will simply worship Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam says, whether one has all material desires or no material desires or whether one desires liberation, in all circumstances he should worship Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Lord. Yeah? You understand? Yeah, uh, definitely a nice explanation, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, so karma kanda leads to karma yoga. We hope. We hope you won't get stuck. The problem is people get very attached to their karma kanda activities and they may never come to karma yoga. But if a devotee, if they're fortunate, they may meet a devotee, then somebody may preach to them, they may read one of Prabhupada's books and they learn how their karma kandhi activities are all temporary and material and if they do karma yoga, they can get something higher. Now from karma yoga, one may go to the Brahman. The different, not all karma yogis are devotees. Some karma yogis are impersonalists and their goal is to go to the Brahman. They want to simply go to the impersonal Brahma Jyoti, to, into the oneness. And they do karma yoga to achieve that. So karma yoga can give one impersonal liberation. But other karma yogis, they can go on and become jnana yogis cultivating more knowledge and becoming more and more detached from the material world. And jnana yogis generally, they do go to the Brahman. They're also, their interest is the impersonal Brahman. As I said, the Mayavadi sannyasis, their goal, they're reading Vedanta Sutra and their goal is to enter into the oneness of the Brahman. So by jnana yoga they can achieve that. But somebody else may go on from jnana yoga, he hears about the super soul and he meditates on the super soul. So he takes up the dhyana yoga or the astanga yoga, the yoga of meditation. And from there he hears about the paramatma. So, well, he's already heard, he's meditating on the Paramatma and he may think he becomes the Paramatma. <laughs> they, 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 they simply approach the Paramatma and sometimes the yogi cannot distinguish between the Paramatma and the individual Atma, the Jiva Atma. And he thinks, he may think himself to be, to be the Paramatma and he thinks we're all God. In other words, becomes impersonalism. That's a possibility. From the Astanga Yoga, it ends in impersonalism. But other, oh, other bhakti yogis, they will go on to take up bhakti yoga and to actually do service. They won't just simply think, I am the Paramatma and sit and do nothing but they will understand Paramatma is the master and I'm his servant. And so they, they will stop their meditation and they will get up and they will engage in bhakti yoga. They will engage in chanting the holy name and preaching Krishna consciousness and doing service on behalf of the Supreme Lord. So this is the yoga ladder. This is the how the yoga ladder works. There may be some variations on this yoga ladder. Let's go ahead. 
links between the yoga system. So karmakanda, as we said, is material and it can lead to karma yoga. The references are there in the second chapter, 31, and then also in the third chapter, text 11 and text 16, both describe how by karma kanda you can come to karma yoga. And karma yoga can come to jnana yoga. And that is described for us in the fifth chapter, text number two, and then also in the sixth chapter, verses 46 to 47. Karma yoga means detached work. So detached, duty performed in detachment. And that will attract somebody who has knowledge. They see the person working in a detached way and they will come and they will give them knowledge. They will enlighten them. They will explain to them that it's very nice you're doing like this. And they will give them the, 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 maybe give them a book, let them read a scripture. Or maybe they, because they're doing karma yoga, they actually hear. Just like you may go to do a hatha yoga. You know, they teach hatha yoga many places in Rishikesh and so on. And people go there and they do karma yoga. They do karma yoga, they help cutting and cleaning vegetables and so on. And so they're there. People also come to our temples. They do karma yoga and they help to clean and cut the vegetables. Uh, but then they say, hey, there's a class. Come on, let's go and come and go in the class. Or maybe where they're cutting and cleaning, they're playing the, you can hear the class going on. And there's a sound system and you can hear the lecture going on. So they're listening and they're getting knowledge. So they come, they get more knowledge, they come to the level of Jnana Yoga. And with the Jnana Yoga, the more they get knowledge, the more they become disinterested in work and they're more inclined to hear and just cultivate knowledge. And then, they get that knowledge, we learn about the super soul, the Lord is also in the heart, we should meditate on him. And that's how Jnana Yoga comes to Dhyana Yoga, described also in the sixth chapter. And then sixth chapter also describes, text 30 to 31 describes how by meditating on the Lord, it will become Bhakti Yoga that we shouldn't just only meditate on the Lord, we should serve Him. That's the idea. So don't just sit and meditate and think of the Lord, but do service for Him. That's Bhakti Yoga. All right, Karma Yoga, someone can read, please. Hare Krishna Maharaj Hare Krishna. Karma Yoga to Gyan Yoga. Activities performed in full knowledge strengthen one's advancement in real knowledge. 5.2 power. Is a bit more? When Karma Yoga increases in knowledge and renunciation, the stage is called Gyan Yoga. 6.47 power. Mm. All right. Karma Yogi, in the beginning, he doesn't have much knowledge. He's mainly just detached. But as the knowledge increases, then it becomes jnana yoga. Right? Someone else read? Marsh, can I read? Yes, please. Jnana yoga to jnana yoga. When jnana yoga is in meditation on super soul by different physical processes, and the mind is on him. It is called Ashtanga Yoga. Six out forty-seven. All right. So meditation on the super soul. This is a Dhyana Yoga. And then finally, Dhyana Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. Someone read. Kirtida. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
Харкишна Громхараш, Эдвард Пранамов был Артишил Пад. Тьяна Йога Тупакти Йога. Сарва Бхута Шитам Йома, Хаджати Экатвам Ашита. Such a yogi engages in the worshipful service of the Super Soul, knowing that I and the Super Soul are one. Bhagavad Gita 3.31. Okay, so Lord Krishna is saying that He and the Super Soul are one. Actually, the Super Soul is expansion of Lord Krishna. So Yogi, under, he engages in service of the Super Soul. And this is Bhakti Yoga. Kirtida. Such a Yogi turns into a pure devotee and cannot bear to live for a moment without seeing the Lord within himself. 6.30 purport. So you can see the difference, the pure devotee seeing the Lord at every moment within himself. And of course, with, not only within himself, but within every living entity. But of course the yogi, because he's been doing meditation, He's seen the Lord within himself. So here we see the yoga ladder again. Lord Krishna states at the end of the sixth chapter, Same yuta tamo mata, bhakti is the highest of all. Yoginam mapi sarvesham madgatin antaratmanam shadavan bhajate yomam same yutatamo mata. This is the conclusion of chapter 6 that bhakti is the highest of all. Okay, wait, in my book. Understanding. We didn't do this yet. The overview of chapters 4 and chapter 5. So we have to look over the main points of these chapters. Right? If you have your books with you. Anyway, we went through chapter 2 and chapter 3, now let's look at chapter 4. What are the main sections in chapter 4? We remember chapter 4 began with the history of the Bhagavad Gita. And the title of course is Transcendental Knowledge. So the fourth chapter begins with very many and several important verses there. Lord Krishna was describing his mission, his purpose in coming in this world, and we heard about 
Arjuna asking his question about why I can't remember, you remember. So the first section is concerned with transcendental knowledge about Krishna. Krishna was describing how he appears in every millennium and he has a transcendental body, different from Arjuna's. So that's the first section of the fourth chapter. And then Krishna goes on to describe how he is the goal of all paths and he is the creator of the Varnashram system. So there are many different paths described in scriptures. Ultimately they are all meant to lead to Krishna. Then there is another section on Karma Yoga, where Krishna analyzes action and describes how to perform activities on the transcendental plane. But the most important part comes where Krishna is speaking about sacrifices, and that begins from text 25, goes up to 33. where Krishna concludes with the sacrifice of transcendental knowledge, right? How do you get transcendental knowledge? What do you have to do to get transcendental knowledge? Who knows? To inquire, to inquire from the spiritual master. Yes, or right. Or other Vaishnavas who are superior than us, who knows better than us. Right, that's right. So the sacrifice of transcendental knowledge, that is the last section of the fourth chapter. Lord Krishna, after describing about approaching the spiritual master, then Lord Krishna goes on to describe about how, how what kind of knowledge you get from the spiritual master. And he describes about the effect of that knowledge also. So that's a, a, a nice part of the Bhagavad Gita. We don't have time, uh, the way they've arranged the course, they've just given a few topics to select and we're not spending a lot of time to go through these things. It would take a long time to go through the whole Bhagavad Gita verse by verse. But anyway, this fourth chapter, that last part from verse 33 up to the end of the chapter is very good. And it's like a summary of all kinds of transcendental knowledge. And then chapter 5. Chapter 5 is actually, the Sanskrit title is Sanyas Yoga, but Prabhupada gave the title Karma Yoga Action in Krishna Consciousness. So chapter 5 begins with more about Karma Yoga, how Karma Yoga is easier than renouncing work. We talked about this earlier. We were discussing about Karma Yoga and giving up work. We spoke about Karma Sanyas. The Karma Sanyas is difficult to give up all work. We can't do it. It's better if we have some work to do. So then Krishna goes on to describe about Nishkam Karma Yogi, means one who is working but detached from the results. So that's the highest Karma Yogi, the higher Karma Yogi. And then Krishna speaks about the Ishwara and the Jiva and the Prakriti. Ishwara, the controller, the Jiva, the living entity and the Prakriti, material nature. This is something which will be discussed again in the 13th chapter, Ishwara, Jiva and Prakriti, the relationship between these three. It's a topic which will be discussed in more detail. It's touched on only briefly here. And then Krishna gives the vision of a jnani or a paramatmavadi, seeing the super soul within the hearts of all living entities. So one who has real knowledge, he'll see everyone equal. He won't just see the bodies, but he'll see everyone equal. 
And then finally, the end of the fifth chapter, then you get the peace formula, which is well-known verse. The last verse of the fifth chapter, Bhaktaram Yagna Tapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram Suridam Sarva Bhutanam Gyadvamam Shantim Richati Shanti, the peace, Prabhupada calls that verse the peace formula. Peace formula, knowing that everything belongs to Krishna, everything's for Krishna's enjoyment, and Krishna's our best friend. So that's the end of the fifth chapter. All right, now today we've been analyzing the progression from the different processes, from Karma Kanda through Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Jnana Yoga to Bhakti Yoga, and different verses and references from Bhagavad Gita. We saw the diagram of the Yoga Ladder, and the links from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. Preaching application. We discussed authorized process of demigod worship and yagya with reference to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verses 10 to 16. Authorized processes of demigod worship. Now, can, can a devotee worship demigods? What do you say? Well, yes, Maharaj Ji. Uh, but the uh, des desire for uh, that is to serve Lord Krishna, to get, uh, uh, to get to increase the devotion towards Lord Krishna. We can ask the demigods for this result. Right. Just like uh, it, uh, in case of Vrindavan Lila Gopis, they, uh, they do the Katyayani fast to get uh, Krishna as, a, as their husband. Okay, yeah, good example, yes. I think it was Bharat Maharaj, he also worshipped demigods, and he worshipped the demigods as parts of the body of the Supreme Lord. The different demigods all represent parts of the different body of the Lord, right? Just like the sun is the eye, and uh, oh, so many references are there. The, the upper planets represent the top part of the body and the lower parts of the universe represent the bottom parts of the body. But different demigods, they can all be related to different parts of the body of the Supreme Lord. So one can worship the demigods in that way, recognizing them as a part of the body of the Supreme Lord. And Bharat Maharaj did that. And, and Yagya? Of course, for us, Kali Yuga, there's only one Yagya, really. Well, why do we bother to do the fire sacrifice? Well, people like it. It looks nice. And Prabhupada understood people like to see these things. But actually, the real benefit is in chanting Hare Krishna. And that was seen when Prabhupada did the deity worship, the installation of the deities in Vrindavan temple. They hired the brahmanas to come and do the yagya, but he said, Prabhupada said, the real installation of the deities was done by the devotees when they chanted Hare Krishna mantra. All right, so here's a final quote. Would someone like to read this for us? I'll read it. Bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal. The culmination of all kinds of yoga practices lies in bhakti yoga. All other yogas are but means to come to the point of bhakti in bhakti yoga. Yoga actually means bhakti yoga. All other yogas are progressions towards the destination of bhakti yoga. Factually, bhakti yoga is the ultimate goal. But to analyze bhakti yoga minutely, one has to understand these other yogas. From the purport of the last verse of the sixth chapter, verse number 47. All right, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. All right, do we have some questions from the devotees? Maharaj, I have one question. Yes, Maharaji. Uh, Maharaj, Nishkam, Karma Yogi and Bhakti Yogi, both are same? A little different, a little different. Difference is Nishkam, Karma Yogi, he's attached to work. 
He likes to work in a particular way according to his position in Varnashram. He will work that way. A bhakti yogi, he will do anything for Krishna. Another difference is Niskam Karma Yogi will work and then he will surrender the fruit of the work to Krishna. But in bhakti yoga, first you surrender and then you work. Then do everything, give to everything. So, like that. These are the differences. Yeah? Thank you, Maharaj. Any other question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes? So, um, we're discussing about uh, this one of the devotees, you know, when he was presenting, you asked the question like, we are doing Sankirtan Yagya, we are chanting, so we don't see any, like, result or, um, like, you know, the environmental change. So if someone asks a question like that, you have been performing, your temple has been doing, but like where is the result? Like how do we answer that? Well, I gave the example, Prabhupada did a, they, they, Prabhupada went to Hyderabad, there was a drought and the devotees went and the rain came. So that was, that was an example. But also, wh where do we see the results today? We're chanting. If we were not chanting, the situation would be a lot worse. But because we are chanting, we're helping, to, we're helping a lot of people. The people who take advantage of the chanting, they're the ones benefiting much more. If we were not chanting, where would they be? What would be their position? If we didn't have Hare Krishna movement, if we didn't have the Hare Krishna centers, where would people be? They'd have no shelter. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. In relation to, to Mataji's question there also, I was thinking, is it that we could use for our situation if that question is asked to us? Like the example of like Rajadam and so? Brach it down. As an example of where, where? You know, the devotees apply this principle of you know protecting the environment and living a simple living. Yes. Where is it, Brajadam? Where is it? That is in um what is this one? <laughs> is that the Brajadam one? Brajadam is where Shivram Swami is based. I, I Sh Shiva Ram Swami, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so it's in Hungary, right? Hungary, yes. Yes, Mark. Okay, so um, yes, it's a very nice example, very nice point that uh, Prabhupada told us, you know, we can't expect that everybody will take up Varnashram, but we want to show them the example of how successful Varnashram can be. That when you actually organize Varnashram, that it can, it, it's very, it can be very nice. And certainly the farming communities, like you say, the one in Hungary and also in Australia, they've been very nice, very successful. New Govardhan, they have one there, which is very successful. And many, many people benefit. And you can, anyone who goes there, you can see how the devotees are working on the land and producing a lot of food and at the same time living in a spiritual atmosphere in God consciousness without problems, without a lot of material problems and without a lot of material desires, living simply and naturally and working in harmony with, with the land, with nature. And we can actually see how nature provides when you work in cooperation with nature. Everything has been given by nature, but we're not satisfied. We have to go and do things like building all these big factories and so many other things. You know, building airplanes and airports, you know, now, now how much they can be used when you get a thing like this virus spreading everywhere, we can see the dangers of so much travel, how it, our, uh, the whole world 
is so vulnerable, everyone becomes affected. They never had a, a disease or a plague like that before. When there was a plague a hundred years ago, it was very limited because people were not traveling everywhere. But nowadays, because people move around so much, travel every, everywhere, so the virus is spread everywhere. Without exception, practically, it's everywhere. And so, we're responsible because we have this unnatural lifestyle. And Srila Prabhupada used to tell us, he said, you know, this modern society, your so-called modern civilization, it cannot last. He said, it's not going to last. It's just a question of time before it will all fall apart. And so we're actually seeing it now. We're seeing gradually how it's just falling apart. The whole world. The, the global economy has become devastated. And we don't know what is the future. But if you are in Krishna consciousness, we have a bright future. We can live simply and naturally. We have to learn how to live in this world. We have to rethink our lifestyle. Just simply depending on petrol and space travel, high-speed travel, it's so artificial. So the natural lifestyle and fulfill the purpose of human life, which is to go back to Godhead. We're not just meant work hard, you know, study so many years in colleges and get so many degrees and then get jobs and work and, and then die. And where's your purpose in life? You may be a big professor in this life. Where are you in the next life? So devotees want to be, we want to be very uh, pessimistic about materialistic life. And we should be happy to take up a more natural, simple lifestyle with the emphasis on spirituality. All right. Any other qu questions or comments? Okay. Arishan. Yes. Arishan Paramarash, uh, please accept my humble obeisances or go to Sri Kurva. I got a little confused, Guru Maharaj, about uh, karma yoga. Uh, so I, the next come karma yoga will come under the karma yoga, or yes. Niskam karma yoga is karma yoga, right. It's what, there are two kinds of karma yoga, sakama karma yoga and niskam karma yoga. Sakam, okay. sa, they're both attached to working in a particular way. According to their positions in the varna and ashram, they work in a particular way. And they're attached to that, they like to do that. They like their work. But they give the result. The, the Niskam Karma Yoga, he will give mo, most, not all the result, maybe. But the Sakam Karma Yogi, you know, maybe 1%, 2%, you know, he's giving something. Mm -hmm. But the Niskam Karma Yogi, he's giving maybe 100%, giving everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, got pronounced. So Karma Yoga means giving the result to the God, but the two types. One they give all the results, another one they just give some percent of the results. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Mm. okay. So. But the Bhakti Yogi, they've surrendered. They surrender. So nothing is theirs. Everything is Krishna. The Karma Yogi thinks, I'm giving charity. I'm giving this, I'm giving charity. But the Bhakti Yogi, he doesn't think I'm giving. He thinks it's all Krishna's. It's all his. It's not mine. It's Krishna's. Okay, good. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. 
All right? Okay, so we'll see you tomorrow. We'll meet tomorrow. Think more about it. If you have any more doubts, look over your questions also in the book. If you have any qu doubts about questions there in the, on each chapter, then bring them up tomorrow. We can discuss tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrindavan Ki. Jai.